بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد After finishing chapter number 26 regarding reviling and fighting a Muslim the slander the sibab cursing of a Muslim being sin and fighting him being kufr Reach chapter number 27. The author, Allah's mercy be upon him, says, Babun, ala tadju ba'di kufara, yadribu ba'dukum riqaba ba'd. Hadith of Jirir, and in Nabi Sayyidina Sallam, Kala lahu fi hajjat al wada' istansit al nas. Fakala, la tadju ba'di kufara, yadribu ba'dukum riqaba ba'd. Hadith ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال ويلكم أو ويحكم لا ترجعوا بعد كفارا يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض Chapter 27 says Once I leave you Once I depart from you I'm no longer with you Do not go back to being kufar Do not return to kufar Striking each other's necks, killing each other's. Do not leave, do not go back to kufr in a state of kufr as the kufar do. Ba'di, once I'm gone, once I've passed away, I'm no longer with you. La tarju ba'di. Do not go back to the state of kufr after me, after I'm gone, killing each other. Striking each other's necks. This chapter heading is a direct statement of the Prophet ﷺ. In this style here, to make a chapter heading, the actual statement from a hadith nabawi, a actual wording of a hadith or a wording of an actual hadith, is well known style and technique of Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah in his book Al Jami al Sahih. Imam al Bukhari. Oftentimes, he says, Bab, chapter, and without saying, Qawluhu, or Qawli, an Nabi say something, he'll just say, so on and so forth. Actual wording of the hadith, the nas of the hadith. This is a well known uslub. And this was not the uslub of Imam Muslim, whereas Imam Muslim did not make any Bab in his book. As we've explained many times, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Musnad Sahih, all he did was made the general kutub. Kitab al Iman, Kitab al Tara, Kitab al Salah. And among the kitab, he would organize and arrange and compile the hadith as he saw fit. Topically, authentic, whatever the case may be. But Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah, his book has the detailed chapter headings that he himself wrote. So in your version of Sahih Muslim in Arabic or in English, or if both you read Arabic and English, you'll find chapter headings as well. Know for sure that those chapter headings were not from Imam Muslim. Those chapter headings were not from Imam Muslim. But chapter headings came from those who came after Imam Muslim years later and made sharh of the actual uh, mutun of hadith, whether it's Qurtubi or Nawi or others. And it's a very important benefit, first and foremost, is to remain scientific, is to be precise in what we say. And Imam al-Bukhari's chapter heading is something specific from what he intends and what he means, his madhab, his ra'i, his opinion, his fiqh view. Or his tarjih, what he feels to be the strongest date when the Prophet made Umrah, or when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, or, or whatever the case may be. Or Imam al Bukhari declaring another hadith to be weak. The impermissibility of saying this is weak because of what the Prophet ﷺ says in an authentic tradition. So that's the madhab of al Bukhari. You cannot say that with regards to Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim didn't do that, that wasn't the purpose of his book. So the first reason, or the first benefit is to remain sharp. 
and avoid error, attributing things to the people of knowledge that they didn't say. Secondly, it's to understand the fiqh of Imam al-Bukhari's book. Imam al-Bukhari's book is not just a book of hadith, but it's actually a book of fiqh. And it is also a book of madhab. It's his madhab, his view that he bases off the sunnah. Thirdly, is that there are different issues which the way the chapter had in his wording supports a specific madhab. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I see man Muslims madhab. Rather, the author of this sharh could be a shafi alim, and he may interpret the hadith or bend the hadith or twist the hadith to suit the shafi madhab. And that is not the way of Ahlul Hadith. That is the way of Ahlul Hadith. Khayran, inshallah. That's enough of that. So that's the chapter heading. As far as the significance in Kitab al Iman, then once again, this is an issue of Iman and Kufr. It's an issue of Iman and an issue of Kufr. It's an issue of Islam and an issue of Ridda. It's an issue of the term Kufr being used. Kufaran being used. So anytime the word kufr is used, then we understand is pertaining to damaging and harming, puncturing and injuring someone's iman. And that a statement is made, an act is done that can do the following things to your iman. Puncture your iman, damage it, or destroy your iman. As we have explained countless times from the introduction, the beginning of the book up until the 44th hadith. So that is the significance and the relativity of the chapter heading to Kitab al-Iman. He mentions hadith number 44 is the hadith of Jarir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet said to him in the farewell hajj, the farewell pilgrimage, the reason why it's called the farewell pilgrimage is because Hajj was done before the Prophet ﷺ made it. And we know that Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu led the people in Hajj. But that's not when the Prophet made Hajj. The Prophet only made Hajj once, alayhi salatu wasalam. And shortly afterwards, he passed away. It says here, Istansat al Nas. He told Jirir to say, Tell the people to remain silent. Tell the people to be quiet and listen. Then he told them, he says, do not go back to being far after I'm gone, striking each other's necks. Striking each other's necks. So we see that the chapter heading is the exact wording of the hadith. The general lesson of the hadith, the main lesson of the hadith is killing, hitting Muslim in the neck with a sword. That's what's meant here. Smiting his neck. Swinging a sword at a Muslim's head and a Muslim's neck is a means and an act of kufr. And the reason behind a Muslim being dis or a Muslim or a mu'min being characterized and being described as a kafir. And if they do it as a group or against each other, they are called kuffar. That's the main lesson from the hadith. Fighting Muslims, killing Muslims, the blood of Muslims is an act of kufr. Whether you do it with a sword, or with a spear, a bat or a club, a spiked bat, whether it's done by pressing a button, injecting a needle into a Muslim's vein, giving Muslims poison, things to drink, things to smoke, things to eat that kill them. This is kufr. Is it major kufr or minor kufr? If a Muslim gets into a fight with another Muslim and he pulls out a knife, a pocket knife, a switchblade, a stiletto, he has a sword, a broad sword, a katana, a saw, an axe type of weapon in which a person uses or any object that a person uses as a weapon a kitchen knife and he goes after another Muslim's face, another Muslim's neck his chest, his belly, his back 
and tries to kill him. Is it major kufr or minor kufr? Does the person become a kafir? Do they have to renew their Islam? So on and so forth. This hadith is understood in light of all of those hadith that we explained. And all the chapter headings that we have explained. With regards to the word kufr being used. If the person says that it's permissible for Muslims to kill each other, that's one scenario that we have explained and one interpretation. Did the Prophet say these words not intending that it's actual kufr, but for the purpose of inhibiting the Sahaba, pushing them back, deterring them from even thinking about doing this act? Don't even think about fighting another Muslim, no matter what happens, etc. We have explained that many times times before. So that's the main lesson and understanding from this authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim. As far as the benefits that we give from this hadith, first and foremost is, is that the hadith disciple should take every opportunity that he or she gets to spread fa'idah, to spread beneficial knowledge. To teach the people about the sunnah. So enjoying the good, forbid the evil. Even if it's a five minutes of fa'idah. Five minutes of reminder to the people. Every opportunity that he or she gets. And we take this part or this benefit from the part that says, Fi hajjatil wada' In the farewell pilgrimage. Whereas in a khutbah here, was this in the khutbah? What was the Prophet doing when he said this? Was this part of the Hajj rites? Did he have to say this and do this? But he gave fa'idah. It's still sitting nas. He told the people to be quiet and to listen. This part of the hadith teaches us is that the Muslims should listen to the people of knowledge. They should listen to Ahlul Ilm. They should listen to them. And those who deliver them beneficial sermons and lectures and lessons, they should lend their ears. They should pay attention. And it also teaches us that it's very difficult for you to talk and listen at the same time. Very difficult for you to talk and listen at the same time, if not impossible. And it's a profound concept, the concept of emptying the cup. Do not come to the table with facts and information. This is sahih, this is ijma. I already know this, just listen. That's all you have to do is listen. And let the one who's teaching you, teach you. Let the one who's teaching you, teach you. This hadith also tells us and teaches us the impermissibility of imitating the kuffar. The impermissibility of going back to the ways of jahiliyyah. Allah saves you from kuffar, but you still want to go back to it. Allah saves you from jahiliyyah, but you still like jahiliyyah and want to look like jahiliyyah and talk like jahiliyyah. As we've explained many times before, the concept of one's name, Allah makes you Muslim, but you still want to hold on to the jahili ways. Not saying that it's haram for your name to be Tom Smith or uh, Tom Jenkins or whatever your last name is, whatever your first name is, whatever culture, whatever you, wherever you come from. You can be a Hindu and you can accept Islam and you have a Hindu name. You can be from a Jewish family and have a Jewish name or Hebrew name or whatever the case may be. Whatever cultural, tradition, lineage, ethnicity, whatever the case may be. It doesn't have to be just English. It doesn't have to necessarily be that French, Irish, whatever the case may be, German, Scottish, from West Africa, from South Africa. You used to be a Kafir. You accept Islam. Allah guided you. Why do you want to keep Kufr and Jahiliya. Even if it isn't a bad name. Even if it isn't a negative name. But why would you still want to be associated with that lifestyle? Why wouldn't you be... Why wouldn't you want to have an attribute of Muslim? Of Arabic language. Language of the Quran. The name of the prophets. And the righteous men and women. Etc. Not saying that it's haram for someone ignorant to come and say, Well, yaqi, why are you forcing to know? We didn't say that. But why wouldn't you? Why would you still want to go back to that? I still want to be associated with that. Wallahu a'lam. Moving forward. This hadith also shows us killing Muslims is not from the way of Ahl al-Islam. 
very unfortunate today. Many people are very peaceful, peace loving. And whenever they pick up a weapon, go to war or go at arms, and then it's against Muslims. And if it isn't a war against Muslims, killing Muslims, blowing up Muslims, then it's peaceful. It's time is peace, 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 and peace. Oh no, there's no need for jihad. Oh, there's no jihad today. Islam is spread through dawah. Islam is spread through media. Islam is peaceful. The Prophet's message was peace. But whenever they fight and wish to become violent, whether defensive or offensive, it's against a Muslim. Someone says, La ilaha la Muhammad Rasulullah. That's very extremely unfortunate. I don't think we need to make any examples of this. I believe this is extremely crystal clear. Many people, they never ever pick up a rock against a kafir. But they will drop bombs on a Muslim. In a Muslim land, in Muslim countries, whatever the case may be. That's very unfortunate. When they're fighting Muslims, people say, La la la, even if they have problems or they may have issues, they say, I had. And if a man died and when killed is a martyr. But fighting against the kafar, oh no, the stunt you had. What is this? Allah help all of the Muslims. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith teaches us is that the Prophet sallam, he wanted his sahaba to have the full taste and appreciation of Islam. You go back to the bitter, sour taste of Jahiliya. Tells us in this Quran, when you were enemies to each other. And it was from the way of Jahiliya to fight and to kill your brother for small reasons. Wallahu alam. Hadith number 45 is the hadith of Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, just like the hadith of Jadir. The hadith says, Waylakum or Waylakum, woe to you. Khayr inshallah, moving forward. Chapter number 30. The author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says, Babu Bayani Kufri min Qala Muqtirna bin Naw. Clarifying the disbelief of those who say, Such and such a star gave us rain. Rain came down from the sky because of such and such a constellation, etc. Bayani Kufri min Qala. Clarifying. That those who make this type of statement have kufr. And this chapter heading is like the previous chapter heading, like the previous chapter heading, like the previous chapter headings. The word kufr being used upon a statement, upon an action. When does it become major kufr? When does it become minor kufr? Etc. Some say, some will say, that to say that this star is the reason behind us having rain is major kufr if he says it and he actually believes that the star gives rain other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should kufr minor kufr some may say when a Muslim makes this statement and he or she knows that Allah is the one who sends down the rain but it was a statement that was widespread a statement that the people made something that came off of their tongues in which they didn't actually intend and mean it. It was just uh, a cliche, a cultural statement, etc. Now, we've explained that before. Hadith number 46. The author, rahimahullah, he says, Hadith Zayd ibn Khalid ibn al-Juhni radiallahu anhu qala, Salla lana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salat al-subhi bin Hudaybiyya ala ithri sama'in kanat min al-layla. فَلَمَّا انصَرَفَ أَقْبَلَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَقَالَ أَتَدْرُونَ مَاذَا قَالَ رَبُّكُمْ قَالُوا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمْ قَالَ أَصْبَحَ مِنْ عِبَادِي مُؤْمِنٌ بِي وَكَافِرٌ فَأَمَّا مَنْ قَالَ مُرْتِنَا بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَتِهِ فَذَلِكَ مُؤْمِنٌ بِي وَكَافِرٌ بِالْكَوْكَبِ وَمَا مَنْ قَالَ مُرْتِنَا بِنَوْءِ كَذَا وَكَذَا فَذَلِكَ كَافِرٌ بِي وَمُؤْمِنٌ بِالْكَوْكَبِ Narrated Zayd ibn Khalid al-Juhni radiallahu ta'ala anhu. One morning the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa led us in the Fajr prayer. We were at Hudaybiyah. 
And last night, there was rain. Rain came down. Still was a bit damp from the rain. When the salat was finished, and the people, some people began to get up, he turned around and he said, Do you know what your Lord says? Allah and his messenger surely knows best. The people replied. Some of my slaves are believers, while others are kafirs. Some of my slaves are believers, while others are disbelievers, Allah says. As far as those who say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and his bounty are the reasons behind us having rain, then they are the believers in me and the disbelievers in the stars. And as far as those who say, the stars have given us rain, then those are the disbelievers in me and the believers in the stars. And the believers in the stars. And obviously this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim. Zayd ibn Khalid radiallahu anhu tells us that the Prophet sallallahu gave an address. He gave a speech. When he gave the speech, where he gave the speech, he clearly mentions. And in this speech, the Prophet sallallahu he called out to the Sahaba, don't get up, don't go away. Just listen, inshallah. Allah tells you something. But that's not what he said. He asked them, do you know what Allah says? Increasing their desire, grabbing their attention, massaging their minds, getting them to pay attention to give their focus. The Sahaba were pious and humble. We don't know. Allah knows what he says and his messenger, his apostle knows what he says. Allah says that there are some of my slaves who are believers and others who are disbelievers. Some of my slaves do things and say things which make them believers and make them disbelievers. Those who attribute my bounty to me, those who attribute the rain to me, I am the one who sends down the rain, who causes the clouds to travel and they become swollen and dark and to send down that bountiful water. Those who attribute the bounty to the possessor of the bounty, then they are believers in me. They are my slaves and they reject the power and the ability of the stars to send rain and the different constellations to be a cause and a reason behind the rain coming down. And those who attribute the bounty to the creation, those who attribute power to powerless things, then they have rejected me, disbelieved in me, made kufr in me, and they have attached their faith and their iman to the stars, to the stars. This is what the Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah, the sublime and the most high says. The chapter heading is clear and the hadith is clear as well. Why is the hadith clear? What does the hadith mean? What's the main lesson from this hadith? And Bukhari Muslim states or the word what? I'll give you a chance to answer the question before I say it. Because the word kufr is used. Because the word Iman is used. Iman increasing and decreasing. Going all the way to the top. Going all the way to the bottom. Or billah, Iman going away and vanishing. Kufr Akbar, Kufr Asghar, Nifaq Akbar, Nifaq Asghar, Fisq Akbar, Fisq Asghar, etc. As we have explained countless times before. As we have explained countless times before. Those who believe that the stars send down the rain, and they actually believe this in hearts, kufar akbar. Those who just say it, etc., as we have explained. We benefit from this hadith, the following points. Number one, that it is from the sunnah for the imam to lead the people in the salah. The knowledgeable, righteous, to lead the people in the salah. And it is also from the sunnah to make salat al-fajr in congregation, in congregation, can come and say, well, you should nah, make fajr by yourselves. Or when you're traveling, this also shows making fajr in the congregation while traveling and not making it by yourself. Oh, I'm going to pray in a hotel by myself today. The message is too far. Okay, let's pray together in the hotel. 
etc. Hmm? We're on the road, we stop. You stay here. No, let's make Fajr together. The next minute you'll be taking this hadith is the precision of the Sahaba. And then a hadith disciple should be precise in his or her words when you're narrating something. Zayd ibn Khalid radiallahu anhu mentioned, he says, Bil Hudaybiyah, the time and the place when this great happening in Islam took place. The Sulh of Hudaybiyah. And some say Hudaybiyah, both are permissible to say. He says, Ala ithni sama, after a rainy night, a stormy night, he gave detail. The Prophet ﷺ turned towards the people. What this shows is that once the Imam makes the Taslim, a short period of time, he should remain facing the Qibla, and then he turns around and sits in front of the people on his right, on his left, or actually directly in front of them. Hadith also teaches us that it is from the Sunnah to give Fa'idah after Salah. So the Fa'idah after the Salah. It doesn't have to be every Salah. There doesn't have to be an hour lecture, a 30 minute khutbah, but to give a fa'idah, a brief reminder to the people. The hadith also teaches us a way of teaching, and that is to pose a question. Many brothers say, oh, he's always asking me questions in his class. Oh, why are you trying to show off? Or are you trying to intimidate the people? Or it's too tough and it's this and it's that. No, that's not the case. Asking questions and forcing the person to think Engaging the listener is a way of benefiting the listener, of teaching the listener, and not just speaking and talking, but making you go home with a fa'idah. I actually learned something today in the class. I actually understood a hadith that I thought I understood, but I really actually didn't have an understanding of the hadith properly, etc. And we've explained this many times before because there are many hadiths like this. Hadith also teaches us the affirmation of the speech of Allah, the sublime and the most high. Allah talks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks the sublime and the exalted. Qala rabbukum. What your Lord has said. What your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. Hadith also teaches us is that if you're unsure of a fact or of a piece of information, don't speak about it. And say Allah and His Messenger knows best. Allah and His Rasul knows best. Some of the people of knowledge say this statement was made or is to be made in one or two scenarios. Number one, obviously when the Messenger of Allah was alive. Number two, when it's a religious issue that the Messenger of Allah actually knows about, then it's permissible to say that. So if someone came and he asked me, he said, Abu Ramla, what is the ruling on drinking standing up? What is the ruling on drinking standing up? Is it halal or haram or makruh? And I said, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. Some of the ulama say that this statement is permissible in 2016 because the messenger of Allah actually does know the ruling of drinking standing up. As far as if someone asked me, do you think it's going to rain today, Abu Ramla? And I said, Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best. And I wouldn't say Allah and His Messenger are best because the Messenger of Allah does not know when it's going to rain. Some of the ulama, they say that you can say that in a religious issue. And others, they say, a person should just say Allahu A'lam after the time of the Prophet Wasallam. Khayran, inshallah, moving forward. Hadith also teaches us that there's Iman and that there's Kufr. And that there's statements that you make which can be Iman and could be Kufr. And Iman is not just in the heart. But what you say and what you do has an effect upon your Iman. Khayran, inshallah. Hadith also teaches us the danger of certain sciences and practices, whether it be astronomy, astrology, nautical navigation and things like this in which the stars are directly used and the constellations are directly used for rain 
for harvest, agriculture, full moon, full tide. When there's a full moon, people's dispositions change. The people's attitudes change. When there's a full moon, this takes place among animals and a woman's body and a man acts like this and so on and so forth. And there's rain when this constellation comes, when this star comes and so on and so forth. An almanac and different things like this. We don't want to go too deep into this because a very, very, very long detailed discussion and a very dangerous discussion. Dangerous for those who are unwilling to accept the actual facts and information. So it's very dangerous when Muslims begin to talk like this and speak like this. And when Muslims begin to depend on these different things and saying, oh, this is going to rain and this is going to happen and there's going to be an earthquake and a tremor and so on and so forth because of the calculations. You have to be extremely careful. And it's also attributed to the issue of the dates, the moon sighting, the Salat times, and many things like this when it comes to the stars. Khayrin, insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chapter number 31. The author, rahimahullah, says, Babu dalil ala anna man ahab al-ansar, or baqala, Babu dalil ala anna ahab al-ansari min al-iman. Hadith wa anas, an al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anna hu qala, ayatu al-imani ahab al-ansar, wa ayatu al-nifaqi bughdu al-ansar. Hadith al-bara'a, قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الأنصار لا يحبهم إلا مؤمن ولا يبغضهم إلا منافق فمن أحبهم أحبه الله ومن أبغضهم أبغضه الله Chapter 31 says The proof and the evidence that loving the Ansar is an act of Iman Having love for the Ansar is an act of Iman A statement that you make, because statements are based off of emotions. I said this because I actually love you. I told my wife, I said, I love you because I love her in my heart. A woman tells her husband that she loves him because she loves him in her heart. The child says to his mother, Omi, Mama, I love you. Because the child sees what the mother does for him, takes care of him, feeds him, clothes him, washes him, looks after him, reads him a story before going to bed. So a statement about the Ansar of positivity, the Ansar were the best, the Ansar were the bravest. I love the Ansar and the hereafter I'm going to meet the Ansar. I love reading about the Ansar. as a statement that's coming from an emotion and that emotion is hub, love. So this goes to show us that there are statements and actions, the action of the heart, the love of the heart is from Iman. Is from Iman. So the chapter heading is very clear, just like the other chapter headings. There are statements that are made and actions that are done that allow a person's Iman to grow and to flourish. And it shows us, the chapter heading, that actual actions are from the title of Iman. They're from Iman. Khayran, inshallah. Al Ansar. Those who helped the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Helped Islam, helped with the spreading of the deen through statement and by force. Through da'wah, through jihad, through letters, through buying and selling and trading, marriage. The stellar examples of the akhlaq of the Muslims. How Islam was spread. And that was done initially by the Ansar. They protected the deen and they also spread the deen. They protected the deen from being attacked and demolished. And they also spread it. They pushed it outside of Medina to the neighboring towns and regions in Arabia and outside of Arabia to this very day right here in New York City and America and the UK and Australia and all over every corner of the earth. They were the people who initiated this magnificent conquest, this grand triumphant crusade of the deen. This was initiated by these great men and by these great women. May Allah be pleased with them. 
So loving them, which is common sense, and why wouldn't you love them, is a, uh, a statement and an action that is from Iman. The first hadith is narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu says, Ayatul Imani hubbul ansar. The sign of Iman is loving the ansar. And the sign of nifaq is hating the ansar. So woe to the rafida. And woe to those people who call themselves quote unquote Shia. Woe to them. Woe to them and woe to them. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, this and that and fulan and this and that, no matter what you say, the bottom line is you hate the Ansar. And the proof that you hate them is that you curse them, you slander them, and you say that they're disbelievers. Who were the Ansar? Where are the hundreds and thousands of Muslims that fought with the Prophet ﷺ, lived with him, and so on and so forth? All of them are kuffar, except for seven or twelve, fourteen. That doesn't make any sense. Logically, that, 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 that's stupid. For these people to be with the Prophet ﷺ day and night, Allah to send down verses about them, the Prophet to say this up for land and be in paradise, his handkerchief and Jannah is like this, and so on and so forth. And for you to say that all of them went back to kuffar except for a small, tiny handful of them. So, no matter what proof you use, and every single verse in the Qur'an about Jannah and about Allah loving is about Ali. Every single verse was sent down about Ali and Ahl bayt That's stupidity. The virtue of Ali who was clearly established, just like the virtue of all of the Sahaba. And Ali, عنه, there are certain things Virtues that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about him. There's no doubt about that in the authentic hadiths. But to say, from among hundreds, Ali radiallahu ta'ala was the only one that had this virtue. The only one. Allah will make wood a love and affection for those who believe. Only Ali, that's it. That's not intelligence. That makes no sense. When there's so many stories in the hadith in which there were many companions that were with the Prophet and they were not Ali. All of them were in the hellfire. They're doomed forever, except for Ali. These people don't speak with any common sense whatsoever, let alone religious text that's authentic and sound. And the actual confirmation of the information and the actual understanding and interpretation of the information. So the bottom line of these people is that they hate and dislike the Ansar. That's the bottom line. It doesn't get any further than that. No matter what proof or evidence that they use, no matter what is said, this verse was said that they hate the Ansar. And it's a sign of nifaq. And it's why some of the people of knowledge have clearly stated that the Shia, the Rafida, are mun he says, Munafiqu hadhi ummah. They are the Munafiqs of this Ummah. They are the Munafiqeen. وَلَيَضُ بِاللَّهِ خَيْرًا إن شاء الله Hadith of Bara رضي الله عنه says No one loves the Ansar except for a believer and no one hates the Ansar except for a munafiq Those who love them will be loved by Allah Those who hate them will be hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This proves Allah the sublime and the exalted loves and Allah hates. And that there is a time in which Allah loves and a time in which He hates. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we don't have to go any further than speaking on these ugly people and anyone else. Those people who imitate them. And they may not necessarily classify themselves as Shia or Rafida, but they don't even realize that they speak ill of the Sahaba. Look like down on the Sahaba and talk about the Sahaba in general, let alone the Ansar specifically. And the Muhajirun are Ansar as well. Those who left Mecca, went to Medina, and when they got to Medina, what did they do? They didn't just sit around, but they fought, they spent, they worked hard, they learned, they studied, they gave da'wah, they followed the Prophet ﷺ as well. So from the general aspect, they are Ansar as well. Even though the initial concept of the Ansar were the tribes and clans of Medina, 
that welcomed the Messenger of Allah with open arms and supported him and helped him. That's the initial concept of Al Ansar, someone being Ansari. But the Muhajirun, as well as the people of knowledge say, were also Ansar because they made Hijra and they also made Nusra. Once they got to Medina, they continued to work for Al Islam. They continued to work for Al Islam. We ask Allah to allow us to love the Sahaba and never ever to speak ill of them and never to hate them. We ask Allah to allow us to hate those who hate them. This is what Allah makes simple at this time. He surely knows best.